of some of the things we talked about. Okay, so uh, this is an example of a case we did this week. This is a JR4 catheter. Um, so here we see we're engaged toward the right coronary artery. And as soon as we engage, you look at that pressure. You need to recognize, again, that this pressure is damped and ventricularized. You see here, it's the, the tracing is horizontal between uh, pressure peaks. So this is a ventricularized pressure tracing. So we recognize this. Now, this was a JR4 catheter. The tip is short. And so wh why do you think we're damped here? Anybody can take a guess? Why, why are we damped? The tip is pointing upwards rather than coactive. Yes. So, but what does it mean? That's not, the, that's not the reason that it's pointing upward. It's pointing upward into something. And that's why it's damped. Is it in the conus branch? Yes, it's in the conus branch, exactly. But the, fa the fact that the tip is pointing upward points you in that direction. When you see the tip pointing upward and you ventricularize, that means you are typically, most often, in a conus branch. Don't inject dye, but know what to do next. Since this tip is not too long, that means you're not deep in the conus branch. That means if you keep clocking the catheter, you will end up in the RCA. If that was too deep, I wouldn't try to keep clocking because you will be clocking the whole conus branch. I would try to disengage. I would try to counter clock, reverse my clock, disengage, and try to get uh, either a non-selective uh, image by after counter clocking or just change catheter to something pointing downward like an AR. But here I knew we were in deep end, so this is what we did. And you can see we kept clocking here and here we jumped from the conus to the RCA. And when you jumped in the RCA, the pressure went from damping to normalization. So this is a technique you can do. If it's not too deep, you can keep clocking to fall into it. Okay? I just want to give you that application. Uh, this is another case we did this week. So this is a patient. We were going right radial. Uh, so we advanced the wire blindly as we do, and we started to feel resistance somewhere here in the mid arm. Okay, we switched to a woolly wire, which is not a J wire, and we still could not advance beyond the mid arm. So at that point, do not use a glide wire, as I say in the arm, forearm. Do not use a glide wire. Just try to take an image and see what it is. If you use a glide wire, it will slip anywhere. You will get a compartment syndrome and perforation. So we took an image. This patient, um, he's about 50s, in his 50s with severe hypertension. And so this is what this image shows us. It shows this. Now, where was our wire going? It was going off what we call accessory or recurrent radial artery that goes all the way up and joins the axillary. So you have the true radial artery here that has a loop, and off the loop, off the start of the loop, here, as it's starting to loop, you have an ac accessory radial artery. Now, evidently, the wire will preferentially take this route rather than take the 360-degree roller coaster. So the wire was going up this. Now, here, what to do? To, well, one you can abort, but let's say abort and go femoral, it's okay. But if you want to pursue the radial artery, what can you do here? Anybody knows? What, what to do here? Okay, if nobody has an answer, I mentioned it once in a lecture. So, here is what I would do. The patient has two major issues, the loop and the accessory radial artery. What I would do here is a technique I mentioned before. One, you try to cross the loop with an 014 inch wire. 014 inch meaning a coronary wire. The standard wires we use are 035 inch. So we use 014 inch whisper wire and I cross that loop with a whisper wire. So I try to make the wire not go into that a radial artery here, that small radial artery, but to go into the true radial artery all the way into the brachial all the way up. 
Then after you get the whisper wire, you do the technique that I talked about. You advance the, the you cannot advance the catheter over an 14 inch whisper wire. It's not supportive enough and it can be dangerous. You will dissect the artery. So after I cross it with a whisper wire, and here we crossed it with a whisper wire, which actually straightened that loop, then you can advance that tiger, five French tiger catheter, but you cannot just advance it over the wire. You have to put a balloon at its tip that will serve as a dilator. So I put a coronary balloon, 1.5 by 20 millimeter, that is halfway in the catheter, halfway out, and we advance it all in one unit wire, catheter, balloon, you push all three together and you cross that area. We crossed all the way into the ascending aorta using that three unit combination. You can see here, this is the balloon, this is the catheter and the balloon at its tip serving as a dilator and we advanced. It was a very successful procedure. So just know this combination, that this particular patient had two bad things the radial loop, which is seen in about 2.5% of right radial procedures, and accessory radial artery, which is seen in about 7% of radial procedures. Both those are major hindrances to a success of radial um, approach. And this technique works well in general. All right, I'm going to show another, uh, any question about this technique? Okay, so it's called balloon assisted tracking, BAT. O14 inch guide wire and O14 um, inch coronary balloon. All right, I want to show you this just a still image here. And I want you to see, this is again a right radial axis. Here we're trying to go into the ascending aorta. You see this, this is a young person, 49 year old. You see this. What does this suggest? Or what should come to your mind when you see this image? Uh, arterial ulcerosis. Very good answer. I'm not sure that's what it is here, but that should be the reflex. Whenever you see such extreme angulation, uh, one, you should realize that you're, you're bound to fail and it's good to just go femoral in that case, abort and go femoral or left radial. Okay, that's one. Because look at that extreme tortuosity, the catheter, when you try to push it to advance, imagine even advancing in guiding catheter, which is a stiff. As you push it to advance, the whole system prolapses down with the descending aorta. It's too sharp of angulations. So once you see this image, be ready to abort. That's one message. Second, as I think Ahmed mentioned, this is uh, it's suspect arterial usoria when you see this. What arterial usoria means, it means that the right subclavian artery is actually the leftmost branch of the aortic arch, meaning the left subclavian, the right subclavian, rather than uh, be arising from here, it's arising leftmost to even the left subclavian. So it's turning around and arising from the very left of the aortic arch it actually typically goes behind the esophagus and anastomosis at the leftmost of the aortic arch, left to the left subclavian, more left to the, than the left subclavian. Um, sometimes you can get dysphagia from that. Sometimes you can get aneurysm of the um, right subclavian artery as a result of that. Uh, but more importantly for us, it makes it very difficult to access the um, coronaries from a right radial. So recognize that image and be quick to switch. All right, any questions? This happens by the way, the arterial usoria in about you know half percent of people have this, not extremely uncommon, half to 1%. All right, so uh, I'm going to talk about graft and that's mainly useful for the first and, and maybe second year fellows who don't know those ideas and you know, everybody too. So, I want you to know some idea about graft engagements and graft imaging. So one, this image is extremely important for you to realize. Where are the grafts typically anastomosed? There are three types of grafts. Graft to the right, to the diagonal and or LAD and graft to the OM. So those are the three types. Bottom to top, 
we need to re uh, recognize their um, their position bottom to top because you need to know where to fish for them uh, so one is the bottom is rca the middle is usually diagonal led and the top is om that's one idea two you need to recognize their uh, position right to left the graph to rca is on the right side of the aorta right and a little posterior the graph to the LAD and the graph to the OM are on the left side of the aorta. Uh, the, the LAD one is a little anterior. The OM one is more leftward, okay? So right, sometimes a little posterior. Anterior left, more left. You need to know those. So this is the second idea. The third idea you need to know about those graphs is that the graph to the RCA looks down whereas the graph to the diagonal LED and the graph to the OM look up, particularly the graph to the OM, it looks the most upward. The surgeon makes it, as he's anastomosing it, he makes it look up before he makes it goes down. Uh, in, in light of anatomical necessity, he has to make it look up then go down, whereas the graph to the right points way, way down typically. So those are the three important ideas you need to know about graph. Position vertically, position in an axial plane, right to left, and direction of the ostia. Another thing to realize as a result of that is RAO versus LAO, and that would be very helpful to engage. I think um, maybe this one, okay. So look at this. I, as I always say, you need a view that lays out the ostium of what you're maneuvering or that lays out the structure you're maneuvering uh, to allow you to, to maneuver it and engage it. So when I want to engage the graph to the RCA, the LAO view is what's orthogonal to it. When you want to engage the graph to the left, the RAO is what's orthogonal to it and what will lay out that side of the aorta, the left side, left anterior side of the aorta where you should fish for finding those grafts as you're trying to engage. Okay, so RAO for left graft, LAO for right graft. It's kind of the opposite, Mem memorize it as a reflex. Right graft, LAO, which is the standard view used for native arteries. Left graft, RAO, the opposite. Okay, this is just a summary of those ideas. Um, so again, you want to view orthogonal to the ostia. This is an illustration of some cases we did this week. So this is a graph to the right. This is an LAO view. The LAO is it's showing you that side of the aorta, is laying out that side of the aorta, the LAO. So you see that side and you know where to fish for the graft. Luckily here, the surgeon has placed markers. Those circles are markers placed around the ostia, they encircle the ostium of the graft. So you need to aim orthogonal to the marker. You need to come orthogonal. Try to find a view that makes that marker almost like a straight line and you engage it uh, in a view orthogonal to it, okay? So this is LAO, we engage the graft to the right, which should come like this, except here it's occluded. Now we then switch to RAO and engage the graft to the obtuse marginal. And see again, RAO shows you the left side of the aorta and you need to fish or start to look for that um, ostium around, along this side. It's very hard, as you can see here, it's hard to engage the graft to OM while it's looking at you. It, it will come like this. It will be flattened out. The ostium will be foreshortened. So it's very hard to engage it in an uh, LAO view, vice versa, it's hard to engage the graph to RCA in an RAO view, again, because it's looking at you, it will be foreshortened. This one lays it out well. So RAO left graft, LAO right graft. Another thing here you can see, this is the graph to the OM. I think you can all tell it's occluded, but here's what I want you to know. The only time you can definitely tell that the graft is occluded is when we actually engage it and we see that nipple. You know, you engage it and all you see is a nipple filling. That, is, that means the graft is occluded. Short of that, you cannot be certain the graft is occluded. 
in cases where we don't have markers, we sometimes start fishing and looking for the graft and we start doing non-selective injection. We don't see anything. So we end up saying the graft is occluded because we didn't find it. Well, the true answer is we didn't find it. That doesn't necessarily mean it's occluded. You have to engage it and get that nipple contrast sign to say that you engage it and it is actually occluded. Same here, you have a nipple here. This graph to the right is occluded. All right, another idea that arises is, so I mentioned the anatomy, which this slide, by the way, for fellows is extremely important to memorize and to know very, very well. All right, so another thing I want to mention is knowing all the position here, all the positions and the orientation. I will go through which catheters to use, but regardless of the catheter, what maneuver should you do to engage a graph to the right? Clock or counter clock? Um, let's say is uh, Wasawat here? Wasawat, he's not here. Wasawat, what maneuver do you do, clock or counter clock, to engage the graph to the RCA? Well, he's not with us. Uh, that's fine. Um, let's see somebody else. Uh, clock, Dr. Hanna? Huh? Clock? So, no, and that's what I want you to know. Is It's counterintuitive. Initially, you may think, most often, no, let me answer you. Most often it's counter clock, sometimes a clock, but most often it's not. It is counterintuitive and that's why it's counter clock. And normally the graph, uh, the engaging the right, you do clock evidently, you need to know that. But the graph to the RCA, interestingly, most often it's counter clock that works. It's a little bit in a different position in a coronal plane. It's not the same plane and that's why clock often doesn't work. The graph to the RCA is a little bit more posterior than the graph to the right. It's more posterior. And I think, you know, the idea here is if you clock 180 degree and counter clock 180 degree, you do not reach the same point. This is a three dimensional. Clocking the JR4 180 degree gets you to a point somewhere here. Counter clocking it gets it to a point more posterior. It's about how the catheter elongate, elongates in a 3D plane. When you clock it, it elongates anteriorly. When it, you count anterior right, not too anterior. And when you counter clock, it elongates a little more posteriorly. So what will work usually is a counter clock maneuver. And most often, if it doesn't work, try clock. In a graph, there is no definite rule but it's good to know what's the most common. So memorize it as this. It's the opposite. It's counterintuitive, graph to the right. It's counterclock most often. Okay. Now, another technique, how to engage the graph to the left coronary branches. This one, I'll tell you, it's even less consistent. I would say most often it is clock. So graph to the right is most often counterclock. Graph to the left is most often clock. But again, you need to, most importantly, you need to put yourself in a proper view and know where to aim your catheter. If you go graph to the left, you clock and you don't get where you need to, just change maneuver, try a little counterclock. Get your catheter extended enough to reach that side of the aorta. That's the difficult side. Uh, that's the difficult maneuvering, okay? Uh, so here I mentioned, and most often you need to, even with a graft, you have to always find a point of reference. You, get, you can get lost. Again, I'm talking about cases where you don't have markers. Unfortunately, surgeons don't always put markers. I don't know why, they should. They make it so much easier. But when they don't, always use the valve as your point of reference. Push your catheter to the valve and start doing those maneuvers from the valve, okay? Uh, especially when you're looking for graph to the left. You almost have to caress that whole side of the aorta to finally find your graft. And that comes at the price of a stroke. If you keep scratching that aorta up and down, up and, up and down, you have a risk of stroke. And actually graft catheterization, whether intervention or diagnostic, has the highest risk of stroke among the procedures we do. 
especially when you don't have markers and you keep scratching that aorta. You embolize atheroma. All right. Uh, so you go to the valve and you start pulling up and clocking to engage the left graft, okay? Uh, that's another just illustration here. You see graft engage the venous graft to OM. Again, this is an RAO view. It lays out well that anterior left side of the aorta. And you see uh, here, there is a marker. This is the marker. See how I made it a line? That's the best way to engage it. The marker is a circle, but you go in a view that makes it a line, one line, and then you go orthogonal to it and you engage. Okay. So uh, just a quick tip. One thing that happens with fellow, you engage, let's say, the graft to the diagonal. And now you're fishing for the graft to OM, which is higher. But you somehow, as you're maneuvering, you keep falling over and over in that graft to diagonal. It's a very common situation. The important thing is to get out of the plane of the graft to diagonal. I would suggest in this case, pull all the way up, give it a 90 degree torque, then push back down. Then you know you'll be out of that diagonal plane when you do a 90 plus degree torque. Then you pull up again and you maneuver whether slight clock or counter clock to try, mainly clock, to try to get into that graph to the OM. So try to get out of the plane, pull out, give us a significant torque and push back down to avoid getting back into that diagonal uh, graft. Now about catheters, that same idea here. What's the best catheter for the graft to RCA? I will take some guesses here. Let me ask somebody, um, Vikram, what's the best catheter to engage the graft to RCA? You think? Um, probably AL2 or I mean uh, Amplat. Right? No, so Amplat's left, including AL2, yeah, or AR, will I guess. Point up. Amplat's left points up. It has, I, I can show from prior lectures, it has a big butt. It's a duck shape and it has a big butt like a duck, like this, and it will point you up. It's actually excellent catheter for the left graft. For the right graft, yes, I think somebody, maybe Ahmed mentioned, it's Amplat's right. Amplat's right has a small butt and it tends to point downward. So Amplat's right is a good catheter, Amplat's right one for the graft to the right. Amplat's left one to two is good for the left. But that's not the only catheter. So M plus right one is good. There is a better catheter. My favorite catheter for graft. Multipurpose? Yes, exactly. Multipurpose catheter. Especially multipurpose A, which tends to point more downward than multipurpose B. That's my favorite catheter, multipurpose. So, uh, so multipurpose, there is M plus right, like I mentioned. There is another one called RCB which is like a GI, it's basically right coronary bypass. It's designed for that. It's like a GR4, but it's pointing more downward than GR4. Another idea, can you use a GR4? GR4 points a little more upward as, we, as I showed on the first slide of this presentation. And I suggest against it. So here, let me show you one image here. I've seen cases done by other doctors where, where is it? the GR4 points you up, then even if the graft is not occluded, they inject up, they see like a nipple and they think the graft is occluded when in fact you're just injecting backward. So be careful. If the GR4 or any catheter is pointing too much up, you may be missing the true uh, vessel here. You're injecting just at its ostial wall. So be careful with that. Try to, I mean, you can try GR4. I suggest against the GR4 in venous graft to RCA because it, 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 you may miss a patent graft through a wrong injection, pointing too much up. So mainly then, multipurpose AR1 and, or AR2, depending on the case, most often AR1, and right coronary bypass. Try not GR4. Now, what are the best graft for the left, uh, best catheter for the left? Uh, we mentioned amplets left uh, one to two. 
I think most often what works for me is one, and plus left one. What else, uh, what other catheter can you use? Anybody has a guess? A catheter that points upward. Anybody has an idea? Lima catheter. Lima catheter, very good answer. Another catheter, so, uh, so this is for diagnostic, this is more for you. It's IM catheter and what you call LCB, which is, RCB is a GR4 pointing, mod modified to point down. LCB is a GR4 modified to point up. So you can use LCB, you can use IM catheter, which points up, and you can use amplats um, left, okay? JR4 may work as well, okay? Uh, sorry, this is the, um, this is the slide. JR4 may work as well. For interventions, there is another catheter called hockey stick that may be used, but that's not for you. Now, this is a, an, an illustration. Now, amplats, this is how the amplats look. It's, uh, I'm trying to remind you here. So it's when it's fully shaped, it looks like a duck with a big butt sitting on the opposite aorta. And it's perfect for those upward pointing uh, cath grafts. Okay, this is a graft to, if you want to guess, this is a graft to what here? Anybody, anybody can tell this is a graft to what? I'll give you an idea. Well, you should be able to tell whether LAO, REO, and where is this? Anybody wants to take a take? What graft is this? Let me take... Uh, OM graft. Yes, good job, it's OM graft. One, you see it's high, higher, so it cannot be RCA. Two, this is an, um, an REO view. Okay, you can see the ribs, it's hard to tell. You can see the ribs going down. It's an REO view and this is the, it's an REO view that shows it well, that shows the ostium well, and it's the highest most, so REO means left graft, and it's the highest most graft, so it's a graft to OM. Very good answer. Okay, so it's a graft to OM. So I use an Amplatz left guide. Initially, the way it comes, Amplatz is hard to maneuver. It comes elongated like this, which is nice. So you advance it and you start torquing it while it's elongated up, up until you catch the graft. The tip catches the graft. Once the tip catches the graft, this is position one, you push it to position two and you get into that power engagement that gives you an extremely robust support. This was a graft intervention that went well with a very good support. So that's how we do it. It's kind of similar to what we do with the native except we put that tip into the, we're engaging, let's say the left coronary, I advance that tip, I aim it to the left cusp, then I push it to shape it up, okay? It's kind of the same. This is an illustration of how the catheter look, JR4, RCB pointing down, pointing down LCB pointing up, multipurpose catheters, that's the multipurpose, simple catheter, one bend looking downward. This is the IM catheter pointing upward. This is the amplats left. This is an illustration with more comprehensive catheters. Now, I will move. I talked a lot about engaging venous graft. I'm going to talk quickly about how to engage Lima graft, focusing initially from the uh, femoral axis. So from a femoral axis, again, so we're talking about Lima and um, a Lima as an in situ graft, which as you all know, Lima is a branch of the subclavian. It is connected directly to the LAD in bypass patient. They clip the intercostal arteries and they connect it to the LAD. It can be used as a free graft, meaning they take it off the ostium and they connect it to the ascending aorta like a vein graft. That's more often done with the Rima, not with the Lima. It's rare, it's done with the Lima, but it's rare. So most often it's an in situ graft, okay? Off the subclavian. All right, so here's how it's engaged from a femoral axis. Again, I always like to position myself in a good view. You want to open the aortic arch. The view that opens the aortic arch is LAO view. It looks from here. RAO view would be looking from here, okay? Would be coming from here. It will be overlapping and superimposing the ascending and the descending aorta. Okay, so you don't want RAO view. It makes it hard. It will basically overlap all the supraaortic 
branches, okay? You want to view that laser mount, so it's LAO view, like most of our manipulations, okay? LAO view, that's one. So we go with the catheter. We advance it kind of to that uh, ascending aortic arch junction. Then we start pulling and trying to aim for that left subclavian. Now, and I'm starting here with my JR4 after I've engaged some graft and the native coronary. I use a JR4 and we pull to engage the left subclavian in an LAO view. Now, what maneuver should we do? Clock or counter clock? Let me pick uh, Wasawat. Are you on? He's not on. Okay, he's not on. Let's try Tor. What do you do here? Do you clock or counter clock to get into the left subclavian? Making counter clock. Good answer. It's always counter clock. So the same maneuver for engaging the carotid. Sometimes we do carotid angiograms to engage the right innominate if you want to go into Rima uh, graft. So it's counter clock to engage all those supraortic vessels. Okay, very good. Counter clock. So you pull with a counter clock maneuver and it will flip up. Now, sometimes you flip up into the inomi right innominate or the left carotid. Then in that case, you can flip it down, reverse your tour, and then pull again with a counter clock to get into the proper vessel. One technique I do sometimes, not always recommended, if I fall into the left carotid, pointing up in the left carotid, I just pull it until it falls in this. There is sometimes a risk of stroke with this because you're scraping this as you're going in, uh, but it can be done, okay? If it minimizes your overall manipulation by just pulling it, it can be done, okay? But the best standard technique is to reverse your clock, pull and counter clock again. All right, now once you get into the left subclavian, you advance a wire. You can just advance a J wire most often. If it is very tortuous and angulated, you may use a glide wire. Okay, so you advance a wire, you have to advance an exchange length wire and put it deep in the axillary, okay? Uh, or sorry, you can advance even a regular wire, but you advance it deep to give support and then you advance uh, that catheter, catheter to help give it support. The most important step here is that you have to eventually get an extra long wire. And again, maybe best to start with an extra long wire, 300 centimeter wire. So after you get into the left subclavian and after you get your catheter in a supportive position, you advance an extra long wire and then you take that catheter out and you exchange for an IM catheter, okay? An IM catheter to engage the lima. So the GR4 gets you in the left subclavian. Through it, you advance some wire, preferably the easiest thing, you advance an extra long wire and you may advance the JR4 with it to support it, the advancement of that catheter deep. Then you take the JR4 and advance an IM catheter, okay? So after you advance an IM catheter, you try to engage the lima. You advance the IM catheter, typically I advance it first to about here, the horizontal portion of subclavian, knowing, and you need to know that the lima is most often at the bend around the bend of the subclavian. So you need to look for it mostly here. And as you're puffing, so you put your IM catheter here and you start pulling back. As you're puffing to see your lima, you very much need to know that anatomy, extremely important. Vertebral artery is more proximal to the lima and thyrocervical trunk, which gives cervical and thyroid branches is more distal to the lima, but they are very close to each other. So as you're puffing, you see the thyrocervical trunk, you know your, the lima is a little more proximal. You see the vertebral, you know you've already missed it. So very important to know this anatomy, okay? And this is how the lima catheter looks. The lima catheter points up when you're sitting in the aorta, okay? It points up. But when you take that catheter and reverse it, it points down and it's excellent for the lima. That's why it's called lima or IM catheter, okay? So that's how we engage. Now, what maneuvers do we do? As I position my lima catheter here and I'm pulling to engage the lima, I mean, what maneuvers do we do to engage the lima? 
I would say most often not a whole lot of torque, but if you remember one, it's counter clock again. So counter clock to get into the left subclavian, then counter clock to get in the lima, but except the counter clock to get into the lima is a subtle counter clock, not very deep or aggressive counter clock, okay? So uh, know this, a counter clock, two counter clocks in the subclavian and to get into the lima, all right? So very important to know the steps, very important to know that anatomy. And one lesser important thing, but somewhat important uh, is, to know, is to know the, uh, the view as well. So the LAO view gets you into the subclavian, but, and this is an LAO view. The problem for the, when you're trying to engage the ostium of the lima, it's okay to do it in LAO, but just know that the, LA, the ostium of the lima is looking at you in LAO view it's best to start looking from here, to go to ARIO to see, to lay out that very ostium. That's how the ARIO, it will lay out the ostium. So I usually, after I get into the subclavian, I advance my wire, I exchange for an IMA, all in LAO view, I exchange for an IM catheter. Then I take the wire out and I switch to AP view. Then I start to fish for the IM. Uh, for the lima in an AP view, typically, using a slight counter clock and pull, as I described, okay? So I have those slides here that just describe um, what I've been, um, what I've talked about. Sometimes, again, you encounter difficulty advancing standard wire. In those cases, use a glide wire, which will be able to go through the loop or angulations of the subclavian, especially in elderly patient with calcified left subclavian. You may need an IM and you may need a glide wire, then advance a catheter or over a glide wire. Then exchange for a long, extra long supportive J wire. All right. Oh, another thing, we took one very important tip at the very end. So we took our Lima images, okay? And at the uh, very end, the Lima looks fine, Lima to LED. What's one thing to do? I, I think so, a lot of you know it already. So the one thing to do beside imaging the Lima always is, let me ask a first year fellow. Uh, let's say Lakshmi, what is the next thing to do? After you've imaged the Lima, things look good. You're about to take everything out. What do you do? All right, I heard no answer. That's fine, I'll, I'll answer it. So in that case, you need to check a pullback pressure across the ostium of the subclavian. The, the most common, one of the most common at least causes of Lima ischemia chronically is subclavian stenosis, okay? This can and should be diagnosed by measuring manual pressure in both arms. You can do that in your clinic in any bypass patient with angina, I suggest you do it in your clinic, ask for blood pressure in both arms, that's important. But we do it also, and we should do it pre-op or post-op, but very important, you can do it intra-op by pulling your catheter. You see what the pressure is in the subclavian, and you pull back and you see what the pressure is across the aortic arch. And if the pressure gradient is over 25 millimeter of mercury, it's significant left subclavian stenosis, okay? So that's the last thing to do, very important to do, okay? And if there is left subclavian stenosis, then you have to take an image of that left subclavian and uh, identify the stenosis angiographically, okay? There is another situation I want to mention. Most often, this, those are the arches you have. As you, so as you're trying to fish for the left subclavian, this is what you have. It's not very hard to engage left subclavian. Every now and then, it will be very hard to engage left subclavian. And when you find it very hard to engage the left subclavian, think of this type three arch, where in this case, normally we fish for the left subclavian and the supra uh, aortic vessels on the horizontal segment of the aortic arch. But there is a case called type three arch where the horizontal segment is already too far out, is already too distal. In those cases, the supra aortic vessels, including the left subclavian arise almost what looks like in a fluoroscopically ascending portion of the aorta. So when you fish and cannot find the left subclavian, remember your left subclavian could be somewhere here on the ascending aorta. 
In those cases, what I do, I do uh, a non-selective aortic angiogram using not a big volume, 10 cc's of contrast, just to see the ostia or the origins. And then I start looking for the subclavian in the proper position. So again, if I can't find it, I think of this, maybe the left subclavian is more proximal than where I've been fishing for, and I do a non-selective angiogram. Anybody, everybody understands this, including first year fellows, who, whoever is here or listening? Anybody has a question? Huh? Any question? All right, I want to describe now how to engage the lima. All those things that I described are femoral, which is how you should most often do it. But how to engage it from a left radial. So it's easy from a left radial. You go from, it's actually easier to engage lima from a left radial than from the groin. And when we do a bypass angiogram, as you know, uh, or angiogram in bypass patient, we prefer to go left radial for that very reason. You can advance uh, in IM catheter work. There is another catheter called BC catheter that's even sharper than IM, and that works better from left or right radial, the BC catheter. But anyway, it's usually an easy shot to go straight. And around the lima, you still need to know that same anatomy. And around the lima, you can clock or counterclock uh, from a left radial. It's not always counterclock from a left radial. It may be clocked frequently. Now, in, your, in order to engage the lima from a, oh, sorry, this, uh, this is wrong here. I meant to say how to engage lima from a right radial. This is right radial, not left radial. So how to engage from left radial? This has become a sexy thing among uh, cardiologists. They take pride into how, how they can do it. I want you to realize one thing. It's oftentimes a futile effort that exposes the patient to a significant, significant stroke risk. So it's, uh, um, you know, sexy heroism uh, that is very dangerous. So be careful with doing it. I wouldn't do it on a regular basis. Uh, it's not worth it. Okay, don't do it if you don't have to. The only time I would try to engage Lima from a right radial is when patient has absolutely no other option. He has aortofemoral uh, grafts, aortofemoral grafts, bypasses. I cannot go there or he has critical limb ischemia. His left radial is weak and poor. So my only option is this, then I do it, okay? Then it's worth the risk. Otherwise, it's not worth it. So when you do it, try, so here is, you go from the right subclavian, you go into the aortic arch, advance a catheter distally in the descending aorta, okay? So you go from here into the descending aorta. Typically use one of those three catheters that point sharply up. IM, BC, or LCB. They point sharply up. So advance them in the descending aorta with a wire, of course. Take the wire up, and typically, again, same thing, counterclock to get up. Counterclock to point it up. And once you get into the left subclavian, and oftentimes it will jump all the way backward. So it's important to keep a wire as you're maneuvering, because if it jumps backward, you re-advance and you try again. So you try to pull gently with a counterclock to get into the left subclavian. Once you get into it, you advance the wire, same maneuvers, except it's harder to advance that catheter into this because it's a lot of angles and tortuosities. So anyway, you get a wire up. Often you will need a glide wire, not a regular wire. You advance a glide wire deep in, then you, can, you advance the catheter, whatever purchase you can get, then after you get some purchase with a catheter, you may switch to a regular wire to get more support, then be able to advance the catheter more distally. It's a lot of maneuvering, a lot of maneuvering to get there. So after, and a lot of time you can grab that. So that glide wire, you have to advance it way distally. And sometimes you inflate the blood pressure cuff over the arm to grab that glide wire to give enough support so you can advance your catheter. So that's a technique. You grab the wire externally with a blood pressure cuff in the arm so that you can advance your catheter. After you advance your catheter, most often you'll try to get a non-selective shot, shot of the lima. It's very hard to torque it into the lima, okay? Uh, so here I summarize the steps, um, okay. This is a summary of all the maneuvers that we do you know, RCA clock, the clock counterclock, subclavian counterclock, 
Lima, slight counterclock, Venus graph to RCA, counterclock, most often. Venus graph to the left, clock, most often. Here is an idea I mentioned before, separate LED left circumflex to go from LED to left circumflex, most often clock if the catheter has a hinge in the aorta. I explained that last time. Um, it goes opposite to what you think. You may think the catheter goes anterior with the clock, except when it has a hinge on the aorta, it goes posteriorly. So those are just some idea for you to remember. Any questions about this? I want to show something quickly, an interesting case quickly. But any questions about this? All right. I'm going to show this quick, those quick images. I, I really like this case. This is a case not from me. Shuba may know it. It's from the Iowa ACC Interventional Co uh, Cardiology Review. Uh, it's no criticism, but I have a totally different take on that case. Uh, I have a totally different diagnosis. And I want you to have that reflex that I had. They showed those pictures and they discussed the case for 25 minutes. When I first looked at those images in the first few seconds, one diagnosis came to my mind and I want you to have that same reflex that I had. Okay, so you look at those films. This is the LAD, this is the circumflex. This is the LAD here, circumflex. So you see those films. This is a 65 year old lady, unstable angina, uh, whatever, troponin negative. What's the next step? Conservative medical therapy, PCI with rotablation, PCI without rotablation, cabbage. Uh, nitro. Nitro. Okay, they gave it's nitro, it's the same thing. Good answer. Very good answer. Excellent answer. They gave nitro, a lot of nitro, nothing changed. 800 of nitro, nothing changed. I'd probably imagine. Why? If it, if it is the section, uh, you know, uh, because it looks like a long, narrow segment. So to make sure why, it's not. why would you think dissection? We, they never manipulated that segment. Oh. They just can took we, pictures. Can we use acetylcholine here? Huh? Can we use like, acetyl it seems like it looks like a spasm, but maybe it's not responding to nitroglycerin. It's rare for spasm, if you give enough nitroglycerin, I mean, you can try verapamil or those, but it's not spasm. Usually if you don't respond to 800 of nitro, it's extremely unlikely to be spasm. I know it looks like a spasm. Any other answer? Would you leave this alone? And that's the reflex I want you to have. Actually, the best answer is leave it alone. And that's not what they did, but leave it alone. Now, here is what I want you to know. I want you to have that reflex. Yes, you had the, you started correctly. You see what looks like a spasm. It's a spasm that is refractory to nitroglycerin. It's a long spasm. This is over 30 millimeter, long spasm, refractory to nitroglycerin, no obvious calcium. Woman, now you're getting the answer. Tortuous vessels. Scan. That combination is oftentimes one thing only. Dissection? Scan. Yes, spontaneous Scan. dissection. Spontaneous coronary artery dissection. I please want you to recognize this. It's called the SCAD. So again, those are the features. Typically women can be a man, 95% women. Typically middle age can be older. Middle age woman. Long refractory vasospasm. It's not vasospasm, it looks like vasospasm. It looks like a long refractory vasospasm over 30 millimeters. Very tortuous artery. That was my hint when I looked at it. Extreme tortuosity, corkscrew arteries in the LAD, in the circumflex. They are dissecting at the edges of those tortuosities. Very classic for SCAD. This is what it is spontaneous coronary artery dissection. And there are two types mainly. One type is the, where you see dissection with two lumen, like we do when we dissect with a wire and a stent, false lumen and true lumen. But most often, 70%, you don't have a true lumen. It's not really dissection, it's what you call intramural hematoma. Basically, the wall bleeds on the inside without intimal tear. And you get that diffuse narrowing from an intramural hematoma. So it's not truly really dissection, it's an intramural hematoma. 
spontaneous intramural hematoma. We still call it dissection, SCAD, but this is what you most often see. Now, you need to recognize it angiographically because the diagnosis is angiographic, mostly. Why? Because of this. In those patients, any manipulation, any manipulation increases the chance of complication. PCI, if you try to balloon and wire and do things, uh, especially balloon and stent, PCI has complication of 50 to 70%. So more often than not, if you try to stent this, I mean, you may have to stent it, but if you do, just realize more often than not, you extend the dissection. More dramatically in a proximal disease, you extend it into the left main. So most often you stent here, basically what happens? You stent here, your dissection goes there or goes backward or goes in the circumflex. You stent here, your dissection spirals down. You create a mess of massive extensive dissections. Not always, but I just want you to be aware of it. So try to avoid intervention in those cases. Uh, even try to avoid IVIS, any manipulation here can create dissection, but you may have to do it to confirm it. Just know it's risk, it has risk. Even coronary engagement, look at that. Just coronary engagement, contrast injection. Each time you inject contrast, you risk of dissecting using what we call hydraulic dissection. There is a 3.4% risk of left main dissection from diagnostic NGO, imagine huge number. So uh, more dissection with, ra with radial than femoral. And you know, if you intervene, at least probably try to do it from a femoral axis, switch to femoral, not radially to limit your risk of dissection. Just because with radial, as you've shown before, you go deep with radial. So just know this. And now it's, what do you, how do you treat this? Just know that those patients have, uh, here, let me tell you, majority of spontaneous coronary artery dissection spontaneously heal. So you leave it alone, 70 to 97% heal, and they are, end up with less than 30% stenosis at six weeks. So the best thing to do is you, if you can ride that dangerous period without doing anything and wait till it heals on its own. And you can confirm healing at six weeks, whether with CTA, or with coronary angiography, preferably with CTA if you can, to limit the risk of coronary angiography. You monitor them in the hospital for a full week because things can deteriorate in a full week. And you only intervene if they develop this STEMI, total occlusion, shock, or ongoing angina. If you do intervene, consider no stent, just balloon inflation, see if you get a good result. I'm not saying you do not need to intervene, you may need to intervene, just be a minimalist in these cases. Try to get flow and get out. Try to minimize your stenting. Just balloon, low pressure if you can. Okay? It's mostly middle-aged women, but one large registry suggests, in one large recent registry, the mean age was 65, 61 plus or minus 15. Uh, so uh, just know that here they stented and immediately, or sorry, they ballooned, and immediately as they ballooned this, they had a dissection into the left main and the circumflex. Then they started stenting and stenting, and they had extensive dissections everywhere. So beware of that. This is a case I've done myself. Here's what I did. I saw this, I injected it, I saw this, I stopped. I knew it was a SCAD. So that's the key, you need to know it in geographically. You can do, OC, uh, don't do OCT in my opinion, you can do IVUS, but just know the I see what the mind wants to see. When you do IVUS, you're not going to recognize it if you don't think about it. I mean, on IVUS, that could look like soft plaque. You need to know what you're looking at. So even if you do IVUS, you need to know what you're looking for. You know what, like Chuba mentioned, you, you may, if you're looking for thrombus, you may see thrombus or you may think it's a thrombus. So I didn't do anything. Six weeks later, I did a CTA. It was fully healed and the patient's symptoms fully resolved. I saved her from a full metal jacket. She's a 48-year-old uh, healthy lady. All right, I think that's it. Um, any questions about that or anything else? Uh, Dr. Hanna, quick question. In case yeah. if you have to, if you, when, when you mentioned one of the uh, conditions where you will end up doing a PCI, in case if you have to do something, would you consider yeah. a single vessel bypass or a PCI? Very good question. So I would consider PCI, not bypass. Bypass is, uh, 
safer, but it's also doomed to fail over the long run, but it is safer over the short run. Uh, you can do bypass, but bypass also has issues because those vessels are very friable. So the surgeon may experience problems as he's trying to sew and he may dissect more distally. So bypass has issues. Bypass has issues long-term because this heals. And the biggest problem when you put a graft on a vessel that is now normal, six weeks later, that, that graft will occlude. You may do bypass, but that's not the first option. The first option is conservative management. If you fail, if the patient has that progression that I mentioned, ongoing angina, ongoing ST changes, STEMI occluded vessel, you need to intervene. Of course, especially if the vessel is occluded, I mean, you're not going to create much more damage. You can create dissection more proximally, but I mean, you have to open the vessel. In that case, I will just try to be careful, be aware of what you have. I think when somebody is aware that this is a dissection, his hand manipulations it changes and he becomes more careful. And I would try to limit to balloon, low pressure balloon, uh, focal stenting, etc. So try to minimize what you do. But good question. Any other question? And for OCT versus IVUS, uh, like uh, because with the intramural hematoma with or without intimal tear, like OCT would uh, uh, delineate that better than IVUS. So what is your opinion, Dr. So, OCT may show you better images, I agree, with or without intimal tear. For the intimal tear, OCT is definitely better. Without the intimal tear, both are good. My issue with OCT is the following. With OCT, you have to give big volume of contrast as you're imaging to eliminate the blood. OCT is done. I'll give you a lecture about OCT in the future, but you have to give 15 cc's of contrast as you're imaging. As I mentioned, this, there is a risk of hydraulic dissection with this. You don't want to give a big injection. And that's why I hate OCT in general, but specifically in SCAD, I think there is a risk of giving that big injection. And that's why I don't like OCT. I wouldn't like OCT for SCAD because of the big injection that, that you do with OCT. Any other questions? Dr. Hanna, I had a quick question. So when you are engaging Lima with a wire, you know, yes. uh, some uh, some other things uh, start a timer. So, how long do you think we have to engage it with the wire in place? You mean uh, you're talking about the standard approach? Yeah, yeah. After I after I engage it, I advance the wire as far down as I can. Then I take it out. Then okay. I exchange for a Lima catheter. Then once I get my Lima catheter uh, somewhere here, I just take the wire out fully. Okay, so with, with the wire in place, like uh, how long do we do we have to kind of manipulate and? Uh, good, good idea. Typically in general, anytime, and that applies to when we're doing radial, transradial uh, left coronary engagement, I leave the wire in. In general, you don't want the general teaching, you don't want to leave the wire in a catheter for over two minutes. If you do, you have to take it out, wipe it, flush your catheter and re-advance it. The idea is when you leave it in for two minutes or more, you clot the wire and you clot your catheter. So it becomes risky. If that's your question, I assume. Yeah, how, yeah. how long is it safe to keep the wire? Yeah. From an, from an, that's the safety. But otherwise you try to keep the wire as you're trying to engage. You know, you can keep the wire until you get on the subclavian. That's typically what I do. If it's taking too long, I take my wire out and I flush it and, and, and I clean, wipe it, and I reintroduce it. You can do for the left subclavian, you don't have to keep the wire in during your manipulations. You can take it out, counterclock, give puffs as you're counterclocking, make sure in the left subclavian, then reintroduce your wire. So getting in the left subclavian, you don't have to have the wire in. You can do it without the wire, then get the wire at the end. I typically do it with the wire in and just I have it and I advance it immediately after I get in. But if it's taking long, I take it out. You, is this what you- Yeah, 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 thank you, thank you. Yeah. Any other Dr. Uh, Hanna? questions? Yes. Sorry, I, I know we have to leave, but I just have a last question. So in that previous period of SCAD, when you, when there is a, there is a stem of the- Sorry, I, I don't hear you. Hello? Hello, sorry, I didn't hear you. Rakesh, your voice is breaking up. Could you repeat your question? 
Hello. I think we may have lost or he's, he's there. I think ah, he will okay. not have the. Let me see if we have a question. I don't know. Aruj asked heparin, aspirin, and Plavix. Oh yeah, she's talking, I think about SCAD, she's asking. Good question. So typically it's, it's tough. The most important thing is observation for SCAD. The treatment, the most important treatment is beta blocker. That's what reduces wall stress for those patients and acutely and long-term. It's even more important than standard ACS, beta blocker. We give aspirin and we give Plavix, even though it's not certain that Plavix works. We typically don't give more heparin Typically, because you know it's an intramural hematoma, it's a bleeding, you don't want to give heparin. On occasions, uh, if your vessel is occluding and you're determined that you, at this point you're having intraluminal thrombosis, we may give some heparin. I've given, for the couple of cases I've had, I've given a low dose prophylactic dose uh, of uh, anticoagulation. It's hard to tell in regard to heparin. The, the standard answer is no. It's just aspirin, Plavix, and beta blocker therapy. And most importantly, monitoring to know whether you need to take them back. Uh, let me see, uh, other questions? Uh, I think I have a question about statin use in SCAD. Yeah, we, I use it because it's hard to imagine statin hurting anybody, but there is, uh, there is some data suggesting it doesn't help. But I do use it. But, but I mean, it's very questionable whether it helps. It, the issue with the SCAD is totally different process than atherosclerosis. It's an arterial wall weakness, is an elastin deficiency. It's actually the same thing that makes you, you wonder why are they tortuous? It's the same thing that creates the dissection. It's the vessel wall is very weak. Where is it here? The vessel wall, wall is weak. And as a result, a result of that, it elongates, okay? it becomes corkscrew. It's the vessel wall is weak. And that weakness of the vessel wall is what creates the dissection. So we, I'm, I'm not, you know, there is no evidence that statin helps with that. But anyway, it's hard to believe statin would hurt. Dr. Hanna? Yes. Can you see SCAD in post-PCI? Like, do you call this as a SCAD? No, no. We already have this tense. Like immediately post PCI, if I have this, this is not. This is this is we call this is the standard dissection we get, whether dissection or intramural hematoma. We do get intramural hematoma. It's iatrogenic intramural hematoma, and this is by the way the more common cause of dissection is when we induce it. But I'm talking here when you see it spontaneously on your first injection. You haven't wired. You only have injected. This is what we call a scad. Once you stent and you have or wire and you start having this with maneuvering, uh, intracoronary maneuvering, then it's not SCAD, no. no she, she had a stent, the stem yes. said she had a stent a year ago. But I'm saying like, is it, if, we, if she, we have a disease and she had a stent in the past, we don't know why she had a stent, she could have SCAD then too. Exactly, very good answer. That's what I was going to say. I didn't get to that point, but yes, this is not immediately after stent. This stent is years ago. So it's not a complication related to the stent. And one would wonder if this is a SCAD, maybe she had a SCAD five years ago that, or whenever it was, that was not recognized then too. Yes. So, what's so the, having what's a stent doesn't mean it's not SCAD now. Yes. Oh, okay. And what's the recurrence rate? Looks Very like good point. The recurrence rate is at five years, about uh, at four years, sorry, is about 25%. And at two years, it's about 15%. Uh, so there is a significant risk of recurrence of this. I may have it in a slide. Uh, I, I don't. But anyway, there is a significant risk of recurrence with this. Uh, most often, what you need to know is the prognosis is very good in those patients. I don't know if I have a slide on this. The prognosis is very good. In the Canadian registry, there was 0% mortality. I looked into about 15 registries and in all of them, the mortality is anywhere between zero to 2%. Actually, there is higher mortality in those patients who undergo stenting. One, there is a bias, of course, but two, partly because of the complication you get with PCR. But the mortality overall is low in this disease. There is morbidity. You need to watch them in the hospital. Some of them have persistent chest pain. There is recurrence over the long run, but 
overall, it's a good prognosis. Just know about this condition. Um, yes. There is a difference though. Yes, absolutely. That's why they need to be on long-term beta blocker. That's about the only thing we know is uh, truly helps. Another thing, since I, everybody's interested in this, know that those patients get other vascular disease. And when I, the two patients I've had, I did full body CT practically, full body arterial CT. They have high prevalence of fibromuscular dysplasia, especially in the iliac arteries. So if you did ephemeral access, shoot the iliac arteries and look for that. That helps with confirming your diagnosis. They have carotid fibromuscular dysplasia. They have intracranial aneurysm, very dangerous. So what I do in those patients, I do uh, you know, abdominal CT, plus or minus, but most importantly, carotid and intracranial CT. Those are very important, okay? Because especially that risk of berry aneurysms. All right, any questions? Thank, thank you, Dr. Hanna. I think your patient is green in the lab. All right, all right. <laughs> well, take care, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.